Welcome everybody to a meeting of the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization. All participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation if you have one. Please do not unmute and mute yourself. To participate in the discussion, please select the raise hand function. Find this by clicking either on the participants button at the bottom of the screen, and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom, or the reactions button in the toolbar. The chair will then call on participants. If you're on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you have any difficulties, please contact Rosine Foley via the chat box or at rfolei at ctps.org or call her at 857-702-3704. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA Standards and Revised Section 508 Standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Rogine Foley of the NPO staff at rfolei at ctps.org or 857-702-3704. Please call the roll, John. Mass DOT Chair. This is David Muller, presenting Secretary <clears throat> Tesler. I'm here. Mass DOT C2. John Bashad, representing Highway Administrator Jonathan Gulliver, here. Thank you. Uh, Mass DOT Highway Division. John Romano, here. Uh, MBTA. Jillian Linnell, representing General Manager Steve Plattak. Thank you. Uh, Massport. Sarah Lee representing Massport. MAPC. Good morning, Eric Barassa with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Thank you. Uh, MBTA Advisory Board. Good morning, Amira Patterson for the MBTA Advisory Board. Thank you. Regional Transportation Advisory Council. Larry Diggins, Advisory Council Chair here. Thank you. Uh, City of Boston, BTD. Okay. Uh, City of Boston, BPDA. Uh, hi, Jim Fitzgerald with BPDA representing Mayor uh, Wu in the City of Boston. Um, also, I know Bill Conroy is going to jump on in about 10 minutes, just FYI. Okay, thank you. Um, at large, City of Everett. Uh, Jay Monty representing Mayor Di Maria in the city of Everett. Thank you. Uh, at large, city of Newton. David Kozis representing Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller in the city of Newton. Thank you. Uh, at large, town of Arlington. This is Daniel Amstutz representing Select Board Chair Steve DeCourcy and the town of Arlington. Thank you. Um, at large town of Brookline. Heather Hamilton for the town of Brookline. Inner core committee, city of Somerville. Uh, Tom Bent, city of Somerville, representing Mayor Katiana Ballantyne in the inner core. Thank you. Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination, town of Acton. Austin Saganos, Town of Acton, representing the Magic Subregion. Thank you. Metro West Regional Collaborative, City of Framingham. Uh, somebody uh, unmute Dennis. You hear me now? Now I can. Yep. Sorry, right, Dennis Chiambetti, uh, Representative of Mayor Sisiski uh, in the Metro West Region. Thank you. Uh, North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Uh, Darlene is joining at the moment, so maybe circle back. Okay. Uh, North Suburban Planning Council, Town of Burlington. Okay, so Shore Coalition, Town of Rockland. Is 
Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Medway. Pete Pelletier representing Southwest Swap, Town of Medway. Thank you. Uh, three members in a local council, Town of Norwood and the Pontet River Chamber. Good morning, Tom O'Rourke from the Town of Norwood representing the Trick subregion. Thank you. Uh, I'll go back to North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Darlene Wynn, representing North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Thank you. And our ex officio members, Federal Highway Administration. Good morning, everyone. Ken Miller, Federal Highway. Uh, and Federal Transit Administration. Uh, that calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Next item on the agenda is the chair's report. I don't have one. Executive director's report taken. Um, Tegan's not here today, so I'm filling in. I'm, in fact, I'm sure I'm the director of policy and planning at CTPS. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'll start with a few staff updates. First, uh, we have the interview process for the new tip manager ongoing. If you recall, Matt Genova is going to be leaving us, and so we are looking to fill that position with some overlap um, while he's still on board. And I also wanted to announce that Roisin Foley, our communications associate, will be leaving. Um, her last day will be March 4th. Some of you may know that Roisin has been with us for five years, and during that time, she's improved our communications and consequently helped us broaden and diversify the people we reach and engage in our planning process. Most of you know that she's played a fundamental role in organizing and supporting these meetings, and we will miss her. Um, we wish Roisin the best in her ongoing career development. And I'll move on to some open positions that we have right now. Um, we're advertising for a manager position, and this is a position to manage our project work, which would be leading our data and GIS analysts and those who apply our travel demand model um, and other tools for project work. And this position will remain open through February 25th. The other position we have open right now is for a GIS planner analyst, and that position closes on Friday, February 18th. Um, next, I'd like to give you some outreach and public comment highlights. The first is that the Transit Working Group held its first quarterly, I mean, sorry, held its quarterly meeting on February 10th. Um, materials from that meeting, including the slides, are posted on the meeting calendar. The meeting recording is also posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and then I'd also like to let you know that the Working Group hosted a coffee chat yesterday um, about the MPO's Transportation Demand Management Study. So as always, please check our Transit Working Group webpage or reach out to Sandy Johnston if you want to be on our mailing list. The next thing I'd like to highlight is that staff hosted an inner core committee transportation meeting on February 9th. At this meeting, the MPO, I mean the MBTA presented on a bus priority toolkit that they are developing for municipalities. Betsy Harvey led discussions of the MPO's new recovery guidebook for commercial business districts in the Boston region, which is something that she also presented here. And then finally, Sandy Johnston led a discussion about the MPO's ongoing travel demand management work. The next item is um, as part of its FFY 2022 UPWP study on whether and how the MPO should be involved in travel demand management. We are soliciting responses from municipal planners and other parties involved in TDM. Rasheem will put a link to the survey in the chat, um, and you can also find it on our website. And finally, staff have released a survey soliciting study ideas for our upcoming FFY 2023 UPWP. This survey is available in seven languages, and again, Rasheem will put a link to the survey in the chat. Please, if you will, share with your networks to solicit ideas from across the region. And I'd like to move on to today's meeting. We have two action items on our agenda. The first is a request to improve a work scope for the MBTA North Shore Busway study. And the second is a potential vote to endorse the FFY 2022 to 2026 TIP Amendment 2. We also have a presentation on the FFY 2023 to 2027 TIP, project readiness for those projects to be potentially funded in the next TIP. And finally, we'll have an update from MassDOT, um, a briefing on the new federal bipartisan infrastructure law, also known as BILL. And finally, the next MPO meeting is on March 3rd. 
which may include one action item, and that's a work scope for the Blue Hills study. Um, that's transportation access to the Blue Hills. And we're also planning two presentations, one about the FFY 2023 to 27 final TIP project scores for projects to be considered for funding in the next TIP, and then a brief update on the study identifying transportation inequities in the Boston region. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Annette. Next time on the agenda is public comments. Is there anyone from the public who would like to comment at this time? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing none, if you want to comment during the meeting, raise your hand and we will call on you. Next up is committee chair's reports. Are there any? Seeing none, Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, so um, at our last meeting, uh, we had um, Kate Victor, you know, who is the Secre Assistant Secretary and Chief of Climate and Decarbonization, talk with us. Um, it was a, a short presentation. She didn't have a whole lot of time, you know, but it was really uh, a fascinating presentation on um, on decarbonizing uh, travel um, in, in the Commonwealth. And she's going to come back to me for another visit, but you can check out the beginning of our meeting on YouTube, and I think you'll find a lot of interesting things going on. So um, that was it. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Any questions for Lynn? Seeing none, next item on the agenda is the approval of the MPO minutes from December 16th. Can I get a motion and a second from an MPO member to approve the minutes? And please state your name for the record when making the motion. Eric Barasa. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the December 16th MPO meeting. Tom Bent. Uh, I'm Tom Bent. I second that motion. Thank you. Motion has been made and seconded. Any comments, changes, questions, or suggestions? Seeing none, Jonathan, please call the roll. David Moeller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell. Jillian Linnell, yes. Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Mira Patterson. Mira Patterson, yes. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Cozes. David Cozes, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton, yes. Tom Bent. Tom Bent, yes. Austin Saganowitz. Austin Saganowitz abstains. Dennis G. and Betty. Dennis G. and Betty abstains. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn, yes. Uh, Melissa Tintaklis has now joined us. Melissa Tintaklis. Uh, Melissa Tintaklis, yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, abstain. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Next item on the agenda is the work scope for the North Shore Busway Study. Bruce Kaplan. Okay, thanks, David. I'm um, Bruce Kaplan, Chief Planner um, at uh, CTPS, uh, MPO staff. And um, I believe the uh, work scope has been disseminated and available to folks. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's, 
Rasheen, is is there a link to it in the in the chat box by any chance? Because um, I wasn't sure. Um, I can. I can throw it in there for you. Right. I guess I can. Right. Because uh, I'm not sharing screen, so you know, um, the folks have a look at it. Basically, um, we have been approached by the MBTA. I didn't see our project manager Eric Berkman. He may be coming in uh, shortly. Um, and um, the MBK is currently doing some conceptual work uh, looking at um, transforming some of the roadways between Wonderland Station and the city of Lynn into uh, a complete streets project, including a uh, center running busway um, and you know, uh, perhaps a cycle track, dedicated um, cycle lanes. And they've asked us to look at some of the impacts of what is um, what, what might happen if this complete streets effort does take place using our travel demand model, specifically uh, looking at uh, changes in travel patterns in the corridor, as well as diversions of traffic onto um, specific local roads, parallel ones, and 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 other other um, ones um, nearby. And um, this is about a hundred nine thousand dollar project, um, fully funded by the MBTA. Will have no effect on uh, you know uh, our MPO work, and um, yeah, there are uh, eight tasks. The um, last four tasks listed are additional ones that we may be asked to complete. But the real meat of the work is getting this conceptual analysis done, um, because they're um, at least. Uh, uh, I've been led to believe they're on a, the MET is on a tight schedule for this uh, conceptual analysis, and they really would like some of the, um, you know, uh, knowledge about the uh, potential impacts uh, pretty soon. Um, that work is going to just take um, roughly four months. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's it. I don't know if Eric is present. I thought he was supposed to be. <laughs> Everything's okay, but I'm happy to, uh, you know, go through things on what we are uh, projecting to do, but. Thank you, Bruce. Questions for Bruce? Questions from the members for Bruce? Daniel Amstutz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I was just, um, the option A and option B, you touched on it just briefly. I was just a little, I was puzzled about that. So. If you were to do option A and option B, would that be with, like if you're due to both of them or either of them, would that basically still be within the budget or, or that's sort of un, unclear as to whether you actually do them? That is within the budget. Um, I believe uh, the first four tasks will inform whether that sort of effort may be necessary. Um, that sort of depth of analysis. Um, hopefully it will be, hopefully we'll get a positive result and things will kind of go well, um, but things may change. So um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Certainly, Daniel. Lynn Diggins. I just wanna say, this is exciting. This is really exciting. I mean, I'm so happy to see the um, MBTA um, exploring this and, and um, thanks to Martin, uh, Marty uh, Milkovich's graciousness in allowing me to sit in on some of the modeling work we made. Um, um, I'm also really intrigued to see um, what is done with that because I could see a more transit oriented development happening along um, this in this area as a result of better um, transit needs. So, so, um, so I, I hope the chair will call on me to um, um, make the motion on this. Any other questions? Ken Miller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Bruce. Uh, just a question about the scope on pay on in task two on page, I guess page three, it talks about the products of task two, including uh, it says talks about data on traffic volumes, VMT, VHT, et cetera. It doesn't mention anything about vehicle delay or uh, level of service or uh, vehicles. Uh, is that is that part of the analysis? Um, it definitely could be integrated into it. It definitely is, um, you know, 
something we, we you know, um, it, and once again, this is kind of a, um, how shall we say, depending on what the client wants, but yes, it's definitely could be done and incorporated into it. That's not a problem. Uh, the stuff wasn't excluded by, you know, on purpose. So, you know, definitely um, that is one of the sorts of things that people are worried about level of service on parallel roadways and, and others. So yeah, we definitely can. Thank you. And also uh, um, there's nothing about, well, two other questions, I guess. One is, <laughs> You mentioned anything about parking, I don't and what the effect may be on parking. I don't know if I know the Linway is probably no parking. I don't know if those roads there is a distant parking or not, and the effect on businesses. And then uh, thirdly, uh, just a question about um, who owns those roads? Are they? Uh, BC, I'm presuming DCR owns the Linway. Uh, presume the cities own other roads or the state. I don't know. So there's nothing in here about. Uh, uh, being in touch with the uh, uh, either the cities or, or VCRs, uh, pres I'm presuming that will happen at some point. Correct. The MBTA is kind of doing that. My understanding is that the Linway is owned by DCR, the bridge is owned by MassDOT, um, and the uh, North Shore Road is owned by City of Revere. So um, those are kind of the key ones there and then of course we have the various parallel roadways and the MBTA is kind of the the point person on that and has been um, so we will be um, working with them and following their lead on that and in terms of parking we're not specifically looking at parking at all and the parking impact um, that's kind of uh, a bit of outside of our purview but we are there will be several you know there will be an alternative where parking disappears um, I believe uh, on either the Linway or North Shore Road, and that is something to consider. Um, but again, we're just kind of looking at you know travel flows and patterns. And well, well thank you. I, so I understand that the MBK is a client, and they're trying to get an answer for a particular you know question right. as to you know, this makes sense and it works for their you know for the buses, which is a per, you know perfectly reasonable question. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. But you know, I think we also, uh, I think I would encourage you and the T to uh, take into okay. account the effects of this on uh, if if you move forward. Okay. Presentation. Thank you. Yeah. No. Thanks, Ken. Thank you for that helpful input. Other questions? Tom Ben. Um, uh, Bruce, I I just wanted to agree with what uh, uh, Ken was just saying. Um, because if you're, you know, obviously if you, you create a, bu a bus lane and, you know, it's going to reduce, uh, you know, the flow of traffic on that mm -hmm. and where does that traffic go? And then the mm -hmm. other big concern that I have, and, you know, we're running into this in some of them quite a bit is a uh, uh, loss of business uh, because of lack of parking uh, mm -hmm. because of bus lanes have been added. So, you know, I think, I, I would assume that, you know, the city of Lynn and the other cities involved here would, would you know, would obviously want to know that information also. And then uh, do you look at if, 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 you know, during, I'm sure peak hours, traffic would get bogged down. Is anyone looking at, do they, are they now going through cut through through side streets and things like that? So I'm just wondering how far you're going. And again, like Ken said, I know the MBTA is trying to get an answer to a question but there's, there's a lot more to this than what I'm seeing um, just kind of laid out in the study right now. The answer to your last question is yes. That's part of kind of looking at the diversions and the changes that we are going to see. What are, it's not right. just we're looking at the Linway and North Shore Road and the bridge. It's okay, what's going on in that greater corridor? What's happening on the parallel roads? You know, are, you know, is uh, Revere Beach Boulevard, you know, absorbing all that traffic? Um, when it can't really, and uh, what is that doing to it? What's happening to 107? Um, so it, those sort of questions are the things that we're gonna be looking at um, and, and studying with that. So yes. Thank you. Certainly, Tom. And just as, as a person who commutes on both of these roads, I don't believe there's parking on either one of these roads. Um, there's no parking on the Linway and on North Shore Road, there is no space for parking. It's, it's a two lanes in each direction with a slight median in most of it, but most but median in the sense of you can put a, a, a guardrail on. There's, there's not a median where people can stand and do it. 
Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, um, so I don't really know how to quite ask this question in the context of OML, uh, but Mr. Bent made a pretty strong statement about the loss of business being due to the bus lanes in Somerville. And, and, and um, a, I would love to see evidence of that. I'm not questioning um, the truth of the statement. I would just like to see um, some evidence of that and certainly evidence that teases out being the loss of business due to the bus lanes versus being the pandemic that we're going through. So I don't know how to get that information to us you know, um, without um, violating OML, but certainly I'll make the request to Mr. Bent to send the information directly to me. Thank you. Tom? Uh, uh, to you, Mr. Chair, to Len. Uh, Len, just as a quick, it, a lot of it is potential loss of businesses because there's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, bus lanes being proposed for Broadway, uh, Highland Ave, and Summer Street. And these are a lot of small, you know, uh, shops, you know, everything from hairdressers to dry cleaners. And it's a convenience type uh, business. So if it's easy to stop there, to run in, do you drop off your dry cleaning and then run out again. Um, and if those, that parking goes away there, the businesses are very concerned about that. And they're, uh, so there's a lot of questions in that. And we're in the process of looking at all that. So I can talk to Brad and uh, Ali, and uh, when we start getting some data on that, I can, uh, we could definitely share that with uh, whoever, okay? But it's more, a lot of the business are very concerned about it right now. Thank you, Tom. Any other questions on this work scope? Seeing none, Lynn, you wanna make a motion? Delighted, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make the motion to approve this work scope. Thank you, is there a second? Tom Bent. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll second that motion. Thank you. Motion have been made and seconded. John, then please call the roll. David Mahler. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. John Romano, yes. Jillian Linnell. Jillian Linnell, yes. Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barasa. Eric Barassa, yes. Amir Patterson. Amir Patterson, yes. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Daniel Amstutz, yes. Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton votes yes. Tom Ben. Hi, Tom Ben votes yes. Austin Saganowitz. Austin Saganowitz, yes. Dennis Giambetti. Dennis Giambetti votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Melissa Tentacolis. Melissa Tentacolis, yes. Peter Pelletier. Pete Pelletier, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John, and thank you, Bruce. Thank, thank you, David. Up. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Next item on the agenda is the works. Go. No, that's wrong. It's the Federal Fiscal Year Transportation Improvement Program Amendment Number Two, Machinova. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. Uh, for my first presentation today, I'll be discussing Amendment Two to the Federal Fiscal Years 2022 through 26 Transportation Improvement Program. As a reminder, excuse me. Uh, as a reminder, we initially discussed this amendment at the MPO meeting on January 20th, uh, when this board took a vote to release it for public comment. Amendment 2 proposes the removal of one project from the Federal Fiscal Year 2022 Highway Program. This project is a bridge deck replacement and superstructure repair project of Fells Way West over Interstate 93, and is currently funded with $3 million in statewide highway funds. 
This project was originally initiated by MassDOT Highway District 4 for the Bridge Systematic Maintenance Program. As the project developed, MassDOT decided that the deterioration of the structure warranted a more extensive scope of work than could be accommodated by the maintenance program alone. So for that reason, Amendment 2 proposes to remove the project from the current fiscal year in the active TIP. MassDOT plans to rescope the project and will likely propose it for programming in the next TIP, the federal fiscal years 2023 through 27 TIP later this spring. As a reminder, because the project is funded by MassDOT using statewide funds and not funded by the MPO using regional target funds, this project is not subject to the MPO's new cost and scope change policies. Again, this board took a vote to release Amendment 2 for a 21-day public comment period back on January 20th. This comment period closed on February 11th, and no public comments were submitted during that time. With all of that in mind, MPO staff requests that this board vote today to endorse Amendment 2. That's all I have, so I'll turn it back over to the chair for questions and a vote. Thank you. Matt, any questions for Matt? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to approve this as presented today? And please state your name for the record. Eric Barasa. Uh, Eric Barasa with MAPC. I make a motion to approve as presented today. Thank you. Is there a second? Tom O'Rourke. I'll second that. Thank you. Motion has been made and second. Jonathan, please call the roll. David Muller. Yes. John Bouchard. John Bouchard, yes. John Romano. I think he had to step out. Okay. Uh, Jillian Linnell. Jillian Linnell, yes. Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barassa. Eric Barassa, yes. Amira Patterson. Amira Patterson, yes. Leonard Diggins. Leonard Diggins, yes. Jim Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, yes. Jay Monty. Jay Monty, yes. David Kozis. David Kozis, yes. Daniel Amstutz. Okay, uh, Heather Hamilton. Heather Hamilton votes yes. Tom Ben. Uh, Tom Ben votes yes. Austin Siganowitz. Austin Siganowitz, yes. Dennis Giambetti. Dennis Giambetti votes yes. Darlene Wynn. Darlene Wynn votes yes. Melissa Tentakulis. Melissa Tentakulis votes yes. Peter Pelletier. Peter Pelletier, yes. Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Um, let me just go back to uh, Daniel Amstutz. Sorry about that, yes. Um, and possibly John Romano. Okay, motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. Next item on the agenda is a discussion of the FY 2023-2027 TIP project readiness. Matt Genova, you're up again. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for my second presentation today, I'm here to facilitate the second TIP programming conversation uh, for the federal fiscal years 2023 through 27 transportation improvement program. I'll provide an update on project readiness for all TIP projects currently funded with MPO funds in federal fiscal years 2022 through 26. This builds on our conversation from the last MPO meeting on February 3rd, when we discussed the overall financial picture for this year's TIP development. So here's the ground that I'll cover in today's presentation. I'll start with a quick reminder of where we are on this year's TIP development timeline, and we'll then briefly highlight the written public comments submitted to this board since the last MPO meeting on February 3rd. From there, we'll dive into the main portion of the presentation uh, which is a detailed readiness picture for all currently funded projects. 
In closing, I'll touch on a handful of next steps before opening things up for a discussion. Before we start, I'd like to mention that there are two separate files posted to the MPO meeting calendar under today's date, both of which can be resources as we proceed through the presentation and discussion. Available for your review are one public comment letter submitted on the Belmont Community Path, uh, and that was submitted to the MPO since our last meeting on February 3rd. Uh, and the second posting is a two-page table that details readiness and cost updates for all MPO-funded projects. So beginning with the timeline for this year's TIP process. As I noted earlier, uh, today's conversation will be focused on a discussion of project readiness updates. At the next MPO meeting on March 3rd, we'll discuss scoring for all new projects being considered for funding this year. Throughout the remainder of March, we'll develop a new five-year funding program. And as a reminder, this board elected to add an extra MPO meeting to the March schedule on March 31st. This aligns with the MPO's practice in recent years and allows extra time for dialogue in the development of a draft programming scenario. This puts the draft tip on track to be released for public comment by this board in late April, with the final tip eligible for endorsement by late May. So I'd like to briefly highlight the public comments we received on tip projects since this board last met on February 3rd. Again, the full comment text is available on the MPO meeting calendar for your review. So one comment letter was submitted by Amy Checkaway, the chair of the Belmont School Committee, in support of the Belmont Community Path. This project is being scored by NPO staff and will be considered for funding by the NPO this TIP cycle. This letter reiterates the school committee's support for the project, uh, originally expressed in past comments. Ms. Checkaway states that the path would support safe walking and biking for students and staff of the newly expanded Middle and High School in Belmont, which will serve roughly 2,200 students when complete. So with all of that context, uh, I'd like to dive into the heart of today's presentation, which is project readiness updates for all currently programmed projects. Uh, and these updates will really shape what's possible in federal fiscal years 2023 through 27 as we develop the new TIP. So much of the information I'm sharing today originates from TIP Readiness Day, an annual meeting between MPO staff and MassDOT's uh, district offices, highway division engineers, right-of-way and environmental teams, and MassDOT's Office of Transportation and Planning. This meeting is held every February and is designed to bring together input from all of these various parties on project schedule changes, cost changes, and potential future risks for delays or cost increases. This information is then organized into the two-page table that we've shared for today's meeting, uh, which again provides sort of a snapshot of where every project in the current TIP stands. I wanna emphasize that all of this information represents a starting point for this year's TIP. Uh, so in the coming weeks, this information can evolve based on proponent feedback, additional project design submissions, and other similar developments. As more information becomes available throughout the next few MPO meetings, uh, we'll be sure to share highlights um, from those adjustments so that we can all proceed through the programming discussions with a shared understanding of the dynamics at play. And so there is a lot going on in this hip right table. So I want to briefly explain uh, what everything means. There's also a key posted towards the bottom of the second page uh, in the, the handout that's posted for today's meeting uh, that denotes the color coding and defines the acronyms used throughout the table. Uh, so first, all projects with a cost increase of more than two and a half million dollars or 25% of project cost are shown in red text. These projects meet the MPO's new threshold for project cost changes which will require that these proponents attend an upcoming MPO meeting to explain the cause of the cost change. All impacted proponents have been notified of this, uh, so the board should anticipate future dialogue on these projects in the coming weeks. You can also see current the current uninflated cost of each project um, all the way along the right-hand side of the table, uh, as well as the cost change for each project over two timeframes, uh, since last year's TIP development and since the first year of programming in the TIP. There are three different color codings that denote project readiness updates. Projects highlighted in yellow have been flagged as high risk for not making their advertisement date in their current federal fiscal year. Projects highlighted in purple in the table have been recommended by MassDOT to be delayed to a later year due to a range of project specific issues. And finally, projects in green have the potential to be moved into an earlier fiscal year because they are currently advancing ahead of schedule. And if you're looking at the table, you will unfortunately notice that no projects 
have yet been highlighted in green, although that could change in the coming weeks, depending on how projects advance. So all projects um, without any highlighting at all have really no notable updates to their readiness or cost at this time. In addition to these readiness related updates, uh, funding highlighted in blue represents places where new funds have been set aside for projects or programs. At this stage, the only blue highlighting is for the 2027 funding for the Community Connections and Transit Modernization Programs. As I noted earlier, all this information will continue to evolve in the coming weeks, uh, including each project's status and cost. And so if there are questions on the status of any specific projects, um, we can come back to those here shortly later in the presentation and also certainly have a dialogue about them uh, at the end of the presentation. So in order to arrive at our baseline programming scenario, which again is, is what's posted in that two-page table, there are a number of assumptions that have been made by MPO staff. First, all cost changes that MPO staff are aware of have been included in this table. So that means that, that what is shown in the table um, are the most up-to-date costs that are currently available from MassDOT for each project. Second, all the MPO's existing funding commitments to currently program projects are included. Third, as was mentioned a minute ago, uh, funding has been set aside for the MPS Community Connections and Transit Modernization Programs in federal fiscal year 2027. Fourth, projects that have been recommended by MassDOT to be delayed are shown as such in the table with their respective funding amounts reallocated to their proposed fiscal years. A um, couple more things here to note. Uh, next, a 4% non-compounding inflation rate has been applied in each fiscal year beginning with fiscal 2024. So that means that projects funded in 2024 have a 4% premium applied to their costs. 2025 projects have an 8% premium applied to their costs and so on. Uh, this reflects current standard practice by MassDOT and the long time practice of this board. And finally here, uh, last note is that funding, uh, new funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law, which we discussed at the last MPO meeting has been added in the funding summary table that's on the bottom of the second page in the handout. A lot of details here, um, but again, we can sort of talk through these in the dialogue um, at the end of the presentation if folks have questions on what they're seeing in the table. So as a refresher um, on that sort of last point there on the funds in the new bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, this MPO will see roughly $20 million in new funding annually beginning in fiscal 2023. This is on top of the funding that was anticipated in each year during the development of the current fiscals 2022 through 26 tip. So all of the new funds resulting from the bill are shown in orange in this chart, uh, with the funding anticipated during the development of the current tip, again, the 22 through 26 tip shown in blue. At this point, we are not yet anticipating new funding for federal fiscal year 2022, although depending on action at the federal level, that always has the possibility to change. So I want to take the next few minutes to walk through the results from readiness days uh, in a little bit more detail. Again, you'll see all this information in that table that's posted to the MPO meeting calendar for today. So in that table, you'll see three projects have been highlighted in yellow, meaning MassDOT has identified them as being high risk for potentially missing their current fiscal year of advertisement for construction bids. These projects are, um, again, there are three of them. Uh, the first is the intersection improvement project at Route 2A and Willow Road and Bruce Street uh, in Littleton and Ayer. This project is currently funded in fiscal 2022 and was identified as high risk because it's only at 75% design and needs to be advertised before September 30th of this year, 2022. Second, uh, the rehabilitation of Central Street in Peabody is currently funded in 2023. This project was flagged as high risk because of the significant right of way required uh, for the project and because there is currently a lack of clarity on the project's design schedule moving forward. And then finally, uh, third here is the rehabilitation of Mount Auburn Street in Watertown. Uh, that project was flagged as high risk due to the complex right of way for the project and the need for significant coordination uh, with the MBTA and MWRA to advance the project. This project is currently funded in 2023. Uh, so though these projects were flagged as high risk, MassDOT believes that they are deliverable in their current fiscal years, so they've not been recommended by MassDOT uh, at this time for any scheduled delays. Uh, there are, however, two projects that MassDOT has identified as needing to move into later fiscal years. 
Both of these projects are currently funded in fiscal 2023. Uh, improvements on Boylston Street in Boston was recommended to be delayed until 2024 due to evolving design considerations at the western end of the project along the Muddy River in Boston. This portion of the project requires significant uh, coordination with DCR and may require an Article 97 action, all of which is extending the design timeline for the project. And the other project recommended for delay by MassDOT at this time is the reconstruction of Rutherford Avenue in Boston. This project is recommended for delay until 2025 because the city is, is exploring an updated design uh, that would allow for more robust transit priority along the corridor. So this, along with the overall large and complex nature of that project, uh, has prompted MassDOT's recommendation to delay the project to allow more time for design to advance. For both of these projects, uh, a one fiscal uh, to being delayed into another fiscal year does not necessarily extend the project's timeline by all that much. Um, the project can always be advertised in the first quarter of the following fiscal year, um, which still sort of allows them to maintain, um, you know, sort of one calendar year earlier uh, advertisement. Um, so, you know, the goal with all projects is really to keep them as close to their schedules as possible, and that will certainly be the case with these projects as well. And again, as I stated earlier, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate, um, these are MassDOT's recommendations as of TIP readiness days, which was last week. So in the coming weeks, it is possible that any recommendations made on readiness can evolve as coordination on these projects between all stakeholders continues to advance. So there are also three projects that exceeded the MPO's new cost change threshold set last fall. This means that the proponents of these three projects will need to come to an upcoming MPO meeting to provide some more background on why these costs are changing. These numbers on the slide here represent the increase in cost for each of these projects since last year's TIP development process. In fiscal uh, 2023, the rehabilitation of uh, Bridge Street in Beverly saw an increase of roughly $5 million, or 65%. Also in federal, federal fiscal year 2023, intersection improvements at Lowell and Woburn Street in Wilmington saw an increase of roughly $1.9 million, or 42% of project cost. And finally, in fiscal 2024, the Independence Greenway extension in PBD saw an increase of roughly $763,000, or 25% of project cost. So again, these proponents have been notified of these changes, uh, and we'll be speaking to them at um, upcoming MPO meetings to provide more information to this board with which to make funding decisions this year. Uh, and as I noted earlier, uh, there are no projects highlighted in green in the table at this time, meaning that MassDOT has not recommended that any project yet be moved into an earlier fiscal year. So that is a lot of information, um, but uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the bigger picture and sort of where all of those changes uh, land us in each fiscal year. So an overall summary of each year's funding is included uh, on the second page of the handout for today. Um, it's included sort of in this table, uh, and the table is it's reproduced on the slide here for you, so you have it for reference. Um, so in this summary table, uh, the current column represents what's programmed in the active federal fiscal years 22 through 26 tip, while the proposed column represents the updated costs and schedules that will, will be reflected in the new tip. So the current column uh, also does not include the bipartisan infrastructure law funds, since those funds were not reflected in the active TIP, but the new bipartisan infrastructure law funds that we talked about at our last NPO meeting is included in the proposed column for each fiscal year. So I want to draw your attention to the second row from the bottom here, which shows the amount of regional target funds that is unallocated to specific projects or programs in each fiscal year. So working from left to right, you'll notice that fiscal 2022 remains more or less fully allocated, while each fiscal year from 2023 onwards contains a significant amount of available funding. Again, this is reflected in the proposed column in each fiscal year. I also want to draw your attention to the summary column on the right-hand side of this summary table. <laughs> Here you'll notice that the fiscal years 23 through 27, um, the sort of time period for the the tip that we're working on developing now, contains a total of more than $283 million in funding that is not yet allocated to any specific projects or programs. The main goal over the next three MPO meetings will be for this board to decide how to allocate these funds. In particular, we'll need to prioritize finding a use for the $51 million available in fiscal 2023. 2023 will be the first year of the forthcoming tip, 
That means that there's a greater sense of urgency to ensure that those funds can be used within that time frame. So when considering TIP projects for funding, one of the many tools used by this board is the relationship between the current distribution of MPO funds across project types compared to the goals that were set for that funding distribution in the MPO's long range transportation plan. Shown here is an updated version of what I presented two weeks ago, uh, which again shows the distribution of funds when all of the baseline assumptions that I mentioned a few minutes ago are included in federal fiscal years 2023 through 2027. As you can see, uh, once the project readiness updates and the new bipartisan infrastructure law funds are factored in, we are significantly underprogrammed across the board. In this initial scenario, 44% uh, of available funds over five years are unallocated to specific projects or programs. That's the tall orange bar you see all the way on the right hand side of the, of the uh, chart on the screen. I'll highlight that this chart is available at the bottom of page two of the readiness table that we've been talking through today. And as we discuss future funding scenarios in the coming weeks, uh, this table will continue to be updated to show how each scenario uh, aligns or doesn't align with the funding goals for uh, different project types that have been established in the long range plan. Uh, so, and uh, as in our last meeting, uh, I do wanna remind this board one more time of the new decision-making landscape uh, for this year's uh, for this year that uh, is resulting from the MPO's endorsement of new TIP programming policies. Uh, again, that endorsement happened by this board back in November of 2021. So as we get into the next MPO meeting, we'll start to discuss the funding of new projects for this TIP cycle. This board elected to set a 25% design submission threshold for project programming. So half of the projects that are being scored for funding this year do not yet meet that cutoff. The policy committee and the larger MPO board, uh, when we were having these conversations, stated an intention to be flexible with this policy in year one of implementation, which is where we are right now. And so that's something that we'll continue to talk through over the next three MPO meetings as we get closer to a draft programming scenario for this year. Uh, and as I noted earlier, uh, we'll plan on hearing more from project proponents um, for those projects that have significant cost increases in the coming weeks. So we can all look forward to that. So there's a lot of information in today's presentation. Uh, so I'm really happy to clarify during the discussion anything that we've discussed so far. In addition to addressing any questions this board has uh, on project readiness and cost, of course, we have our partners at MassDOT um, on, you know, in the meeting today too, to help uh, elucidate some of the reasons for those recommendations as needed. Um, please also feel free to ask questions or provide your thoughts on how the information presented today may impact the programming decisions that we will discuss in the coming meetings. Uh, including the funding of new projects. Uh, really want to make sure that this is a good foundation setting conversation for the next three meetings. And so if you have questions on anything, um, please, please don't hesitate to ask. Before we discuss all of those topics, I'll briefly highlight where we're heading in the coming weeks. Um, so at the next MPO meeting on March 3rd, we'll go into a little bit more detail on project scoring for the new projects that are seeking MPO funding this year. Throughout the remainder of March, we'll discuss a range of scenarios for the final TIP program uh, with the goal of arriving at a draft five-year plan by the end of March. In late April, we'll provide a draft TIP report to this board, which we anticipate releasing for a 21-day public comment period after the MPO takes a vote to do so. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair to begin the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Questions, comments, discussion from MPO members? Daniel Amstutz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Matt, for that thorough presentation for the details and the readiness. Um, and I have a couple of questions. I'll just kick it off. A couple of questions that come to mind. Um, maybe I'll just ask them both first. Uh, one being I'm looking at the spreadsheet of uh, projects to score that was from the last meeting. And I'm wondering, have you calculated the, based on the cost estimates for all of those projects, like what is the, I guess, what is the ask based on the projects that are to be scored? Like how does that compare to the unprogrammed amount that we see on the new spreadsheet? And then secondly, um, regarding Rutherford Ave, I'm, I'm curious the way that the spreadsheet shows is like, you know, 
removing or delaying the project. Um, but, and then sort of takes out a bunch of money from those years, but doesn't necessarily put them back in later years. And I'm kind of, I sort of forget if we're, you know, you know the commitment that we're giving to that project would that assume, you know, if the project is 100 million or 120 million, whatever it is, you know, should we assume in the later year or years that we need to put in funding for that project? Yeah, both great questions. Um, I'll start with your second question first and say, uh, yes, we should assume that, um, you know, after some discussion, you know, over the next several weeks that, you know, any projects that have been delayed, um, whether it's Rutherford Avenue or, or other projects, um, you know, that the funding that is sort of taken out of the early year, the delayed year, will show up in a later year somewhere. And so, um, so you know, for, in this case, specifically to answer your question, um, you know, the funding for Rutherford Avenue um, was taken out of 2023 and 2024, but the anticipation is that, you know, we would add new funding um, in 2027 and then anticipate, you know, future years of funding after that um, to, to continue until the, you know, the funding is covered. Um, you know, I think tentatively we've had that project slated at five years of funding. Um, and so, you know, we're, that's roughly what we would anticipate, you know, although obviously we'll have continued discussions about that um, with this board over the next three meetings. Um, and then going to your first question. So um, the total funding request is, I don't have the exact number on hand, but it's in the neighborhood of $350 million. Um, although that number you know, will fluctuate as some of, uh, some of those projects that we're scoring for funding um, continue to advance. The caveat is that you know, all of you know, those projects can't all be funded sort of on the timeline that's covered by the current TIP. Um, you know, specifically larger projects um, like the Route 9 and 27 interchange project in Natick uh, and the uh, McGrath Boulevard project in Somerville, you know, we would anticipate that funding for those projects would probably occur over multiple fiscal years each. Uh, and so even if we were to start funding, you know, in the current timeframe covered by the, the forthcoming TIP, fiscals 2023 through 27, um, we probably wouldn't have all of the funding for either of those projects uh, in that timeframe. You know, the, the funding timeline would would very likely extend outward into 2028 and beyond. Uh, and so, you know, one of the big questions, um, you know, going into the next three MPO meetings will be, you know, the extent to which we can find other projects that may not necessarily be on the scoring list for this year um, that would be ready for earlier programming, recognizing that, you know, we do have funding available in fiscals um, 2023, uh, 2024, you know, the earlier fiscal years of the TIP where, um, you know, very likely the projects that we're scoring for funding this year uh, would not be ready for funding on that timeline. Um, and so, you know, an example of this is, is last year, um, you know, we had funding in fiscal 2021 that came available. And so this board, you know, elected to allocate that funding to um, phase two of the Columbus Avenue bus lane project in Boston. Um, so, you know, at this point, you know, given, given where things stand today, we anticipate probably, you know, similar discussions along those lines to try to find other projects that might be ready on an earlier timeline to take those funds that will sort of be uh, pushed out a little bit later. So hope that all makes sense, but happy to clarify if needed. That sounds good. I, I appreciate that. Thanks very much. Eric Barasa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Matt, I think something that would be helpful um, for the members uh, for the upcoming conversations in March, for the projects that are not at 25% design, I think it would be good to, to understand where they are at. Like, is something um, you know just PRC approved, have, but has not had many conversations, you know, with with the district office or or with the with the Boston office? Has the, has have they had that? Um, John Bouchard, you know, mentioned to us how there's now sort of a formalized kind of pre twenty five percent meeting. I, I think some just more information on where that like the project stands with respect to sort of the cost estimate, um, I think would be helpful for folks in, in, in you know, just trying to understand, how, you know, where the project's at, 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 you know, in the process to, to be mindful of wanting to, to, to program projects with the best cost of estimate as, as possible as, as a factor in our, in our thinking about um, how we put the program 
together. Yeah, I can definitely work on that and bring that for a, the upcoming meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Ian Miller. You're muted, Ken. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, just two points. One, uh, related to the the the, uh, the projects like Rutherford Avenue and Grath Boulevard, which are spread out over several years of dance constructing in effect, which is a device that allows you to spread the funding over the life of the project, doesn't mean that you actually have to. You can pay so. Uh, just because you have a schedule, uh, just because a project will last five years doesn't mean you have to spread out the money. So if you do have available funding, you can accelerate it, pay it off earlier, and it frees up money in later years. So it's just something to keep in mind uh, as, as you're um, trying to figure out how to, how to uh, fill in the gaps. The other thing I would mention too is uh, for fiscal year 22, the uh, current fiscal year, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we are under a continuing resolution. Uh, we, there probably more likely be a new one tomorrow, but uh, on, uh, our hope is that it's going to be a short-term uh, continuing resolution, and they will, Congress will finally decide to, uh, you know, come up with a budget for the whole year. Uh, but the but the funding, the bill funding for 2022 has been apportioned and allocated. Uh, what's missing now is, in effect, the obligation authority to be able to spend all of it. But uh, I think it's uh, there's a good chance that that will be available uh, this year. And, uh, and I guess pending any discussions with, between the state and among the state and the MPOs as to whether the targets will go up in 2022 or what happens with that increased funding, I, I think it would make sense to at least. Uh, plan for some additional funding in 2022. Thanks, Ken. Thanks. I, I do have an even bigger problem, but you know. <laughs> Dave Monty. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a kind of general question about um, how readiness is, is evaluated. Um, is there any consideration given to, you know, if a project is not ready for a given fiscal year, what it would take to make it ready for an earlier fiscal year? Um, or is it is it simply a look at sort of the externalities and, and where a project is and where we expect it to be? And I say that just with reference to having to fill this big hole in 2023, um, are the projects that with some help somewhere, whether it be assistance to the city or town, assistance to MassDOT, is, is there someone to understand are there projects that could be accelerated with a little bit extra help? So I will, I, I will take this one and then John Bouchard can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. So here's what I believe is true. At readiness days, yes, we have done a, a preliminary analysis to look at whether projects that are programmed in outer years of the TIP can be made ready for an earlier year. Um, it's, you know, it is a preliminary analysis. It, it, you know, as, as Matt noted, we didn't identify any in the Boston region. That doesn't mean by the time we get to TIP development with discussions with cities and towns, we may not find one or two, but by and large, yes, John Bouchard's staff does a, a screen of readiness of what, what needs to be moved out, what's possibly going to be needing to be moved out, and what can be moved forward. Right, John? Yes, that's, that's, that's correct. That's correct, David. Um, so that I, the only thing I would, I would add to that is that, yes, we look at the full, you know, the current tip that we're working in, so the, so the four to five years or the four years that are remaining, and we assess everything in, those, in the current year and then the future three years to see if we see a challenge in delivering the project in that timeline, or is there an opportunity to bring something forward? And we identify that with uh, David's team, and then we meet with the MPO staff uh, over you know a couple of days, and we go through that. And, and as um, Matt offered in his you know, presentation, you know, there were a couple of projects at the beginning, Littleton Air, Peabody, and Watertown, that you know we feel we're holding the current year but we feel there's some challenges to getting those done for the for uh, fiscal 22 23 respectively on uh, on those three and then also but we held them and then the two projects in boston boylston street and rutherford ave that we were recommending be pushed out because of changes in design changes in permitting etc and the ability to deliver that project 
Um, so, I mean, we assess all that stuff, Jay, and then we make recommendations or we hold, and then we understand that there's a balance. You know, we don't want to create um, uh, holes in uh, regional tips, and then we'll meet individually with David's team uh, and some of the MPO partners to, to look at, you know, what our options are. And we may flag a few that, as, as David said, could be accelerated, um, but, you know, it's, it's a snapshot, best information that we had over the last, you know, month or so. Uh, I mean, the information we, we scrubbed over the last month or so, but it's clearly information that we've been working on for a number of years. Thank you, John. And then, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jay. Dennis Jean Betty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A couple of quick questions. One is, will we see a list of uh, potential projects uh, that could be programmed for each of the years, especially the 2023 and 2024? And the second question is, is a follow up on Eric's comments. It'd be great if we could have a, maybe a risk factor in each one of those projects um, based on cost and readiness. Uh, so you can kind of evaluate you know, what, what is the risk associated with those. Thank you. Yep, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so in response to your, yeah, your, um, well, sort of both questions really, we'll, we'll talk through all the projects that we are considering for funding that we're scoring right now uh, at the next MPO meeting. And so, uh, you know, to Eric's question earlier as well, we'll come uh, prepared not only with some project descriptions and, and the scores, but then also an, an assessment of how ready they are um, for programming and how close they are to that 25% uh, design threshold. So that's sort of one element of this. And then you know, the, the second element here, which you're sort of getting at is that, you know, we will probably need to do a little bit of, of hunting for some new projects that may be ready in earlier fiscal years that might not necessarily be on our project scoring list. Um, just given the sort of, you know, exceptional nature of this being a, a year where a lot of new funding is coming in in, in the early years of the TIP as a result of, of the new infrastructure law. Uh, and so we'll continue to work with, uh, you know, our partners at, at MassDOT and the T and, and the RTAs to you know, source those projects and understand uh, what the landscape might look like um, to fill some of those earlier gaps. And then we'll certainly bring those uh, to this board for consideration. Any other questions from members? Tom Bitt. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, in, in, you know, the discussion about readiness, uh, I know, you know, we've been frustrated, I think, at the pace of, uh, of uh, trying to get the design readiness uh, for McGrath. And, you know, is, is, you know, we were hoping to be further along than we are right now. And I know there's been reasons, COVID and all that. Uh, but there's an example of, you know, where uh, there's going to be, you know, some significant amount of funding available. And is there, you know, any way or commitment that we can get that we can try to speed up that process on McGrath. Um, and then uh, the second, I, maybe after you answer that, I do have another question about uh, inflation on these costs. Okay, so uh, I don't think I can commit to speeding up McGrath any more than we're committed to trying to speed up all of our projects, right? So yes, to, to, that, that's a little flip, Tom. To be clear, McGrath is important to us. So yes, yeah. we, we, we will look at McGrath and figure out a way, is there, is there a chance, is there a way to expedite design of McGrath to get it ready? Okay, no, that's that's all I, it's all I uh, wanted to hear. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. No um, yeah, you know, cause it, it's been a long process and you know, uh, we, it, the, the commitments was a long time ago and you know, I know they're finally sitting down and starting to uh, move on it, but uh, it's, you know, now all of a sudden this money's available and it'd be great to be able to use it. Absolutely. Um, the second question is, uh, is I, I know, Matt, you know, you talked about, you know, the 4% inflation. And uh, I know in my own business, we're seeing uh, construction inflation is just off the charts. I, in all 42 years I've been in business, I have never seen the inflation rate on materials like we're seeing now. And one of my concerns is, is, you know, we only had a handful of projects that came in with cost increase. And what I'm wondering is, has anybody taken a look at all these other projects to see, you know, where they think they are when they got to start to uh, procure materials and things like that? I know uh, what I'm hearing is, is, you know, especially in my business, conduit wire, all that kind of stuff is just 200% in some areas. I've been hearing asphalt prices are crazy. 
Um, so I, that's just a concern. And, you know, I don't think the 4%, well, I think what everybody's hoping is it'll get under control and it'll start dropping soon. You know, but we, we, we thought that six months ago and it, it is still going up. So uh, I just want to make sure people are aware of that because we could see some increases that we're not anticipating. And I don't know if John Bashad or anybody else wants to speak about it because I'm sure it's on their mind too. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go first, John, and you can again correct me, okay? So, so yes, Tom, we are tracking it on an ongoing basis as we open bids. Um, there are a few projects that, that gave us pause. Those are typically projects that have specific, um, like need a lot of steel as an example, yep. okay? It's not our everyday project that is that is going through the roof. It is it is particular projects with particular um, elements. But we are tracking it. We're very mindful of it. There was a point where we were concerned that inflation might eat up a lot of this new money. We're not we're not as concerned, but we are continuing to track it. John. Wait, John, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, David, I, I would echo that comment. It is something, Tom, that we're tracking, trying to keep a, trying to keep a, uh, 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 an outlook on. We are factoring in, um, you know, inf inflation costs and seeing what was what we're seeing in industry and uh, applying those factors to say, you know, how confident do we feel in those numbers? Uh, all, you know, just to echo again what David said, it's some of our specialty some of the specialty work is, you know, with significant steel and um, in concrete and different type of work in the water that we're looking at, you know, what materials are going to have to be procured and trying to keep an eye on that. We do independent cost estimates on larger scale projects to try and stay ahead of that. And uh, we're just trying to, you know, maintain an outward focus as best we can and and um, and and not uh, you know not be too surprised, uh, you know we are fo we are focusing and trying to stay ahead of it. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's not just the inflation; it's also the supply chain issues. Trying to get right. um, everything for in, which I'm sure you run into, you know, uh, electrical switch gear generators, all that kind of stuff is just absolutely crazy right now. Um, but no, that's glad you're tracking it. I just wanted the members to be aware that you know we we may we may see some issues with that. Thank you. Uh, other members before I call on the public? Anybody else? Seeing none, Rich Benevento. Good morning and thank you. Uh, so a couple of the projects that uh, Matt had on the list there, uh, we are involved in. I didn't know if today was a time to actually give a quick update on those, which were uh, Peabody, uh, Watertown, and of course the increase on Bridge Street, but uh, happy to provide a little bit of, of information. Uh, one thing I would like to just just based on this discussion that Tom Bent and John Bashad and yourself were just discussing about cost increase uh, on projects. I think one of the things to consider in Beverly, we saw uh, Bridge Street in Beverly showed a 65% increase in cost. A um, couple of things, a couple of factors here. First and foremost, when the original estimate was done uh, during the uh, PRC process and, um, and approval process, it was you know a few years back. I think we've had discussions about, you know, is this four percent inflation um, number that we use is is that is that really effective? And I think Eric Barasser and his subcommittee were talking about that during their uh, deliberations on, you know, how do we handle these increases in costs? Uh, obviously, the four percent is probably not enough to cover things. Uh, and then on top of that is all of the add-ons at the end of the uh, at once the project's ready for advertising, construction, engineering, police, traffic. Et cetera. Um, our office estimate, the office estimate for Bridge Street right now uh, is 10.2 million. Uh, I think originally it was uh, right around eight. Um, it's shown on today's uh, spreadsheet is 12. I'm presuming that adds the additional construction engineering and all the additional add-ons at the end. Um, but you can see there's about a 20% increase, at least from our office estimate to the 12 million that's shown. Uh, and again, that I think uh, is, is indicative of number one, the increase in costs that we just talked about. We're seeing uh, at the consultant level, 30% increases in, in, uh, in major items. Um, so it's not unusual to see you know, these kind of numbers. I think the, the important thing is, is that the project, the cost increase is not due to scope creep. 
Uh, additional streets weren't added. The project limits weren't extended. Uh, I think it's just, it is what it is kind of a thing. Um, cost of asphalt, uh, cost of uh, granite curbing even has uh, gone up uh, in, um, quite extensively. So it's just things like that. I think it's just the nature of the beast right now. Um, the other two projects that were, uh, that were mentioned today were Peabody uh, in um, Mount Auburn Street in Watertown. Um, uh, Peabody is in the 75% design phase. We have been working closely with MassDOT and, and the team at MassDOT relative to where the project is. Is it gonna be ready uh, for the 23 uh, TIP year? Uh, we feel confident that it will be. 75% um, plans will be going in sort of the March, April timeline. Once those are in, uh, we're currently working on, um, uh, the city's currently working on the right of way, uh, recordable plans, that process will start soon. Uh, and then similarly with Mount Auburn Street and Watertown, I think we've finally reached, uh, the town's finally reached detente with uh, the MBTA. We know that that's been a, a process, um, uh, but I uh, believe that, uh, that uh, there's been, uh, the coordination uh, that's been going on has uh, proved that the project can, can now advance. 75% um, plans for that are due uh, uh, May-June timeline. Um, the town has appropriated the money for right away, and, and so we anticipate that that project will be advancing as well. There was also some uh, concern about utility coordination with National Grid and MWRA, and um, there's been discussions over the last year uh, with uh, the MBTA, National Grid, uh, and other utility providers to make sure that this project's going to uh, go off as, uh, as planned. So. I know that uh, next meeting is really when we're going to be talking about this stuff, but happened to be on the call and thought I'd just offer some comments. Thanks, Rich. Other comments from the MPO, from MPO members? Any questions, comments? Seeing none. Thanks, Matt. Next item on the agenda is a presentation on the federal bipartisan infrastructure law. I'm going to give it, so I'm going to try to share my screen if this doesn't work. Uh, the MPO staff will take over again. All right, so Matt Archer, I'm going to go request remote control, right? Uh, no, you're going to want to hit, uh, it might say new share or screen share. It's a green button on the toolbar, and you'll be able to interrupt right. my sharing. You're the best, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's see if we can see this when I do this. Can everybody see that? We can see that. Excellent. Yes. All right. All right. So I was asked to present today on the um, bipartisan infrastructure law. So today's today's agenda is highway formula programs, transit formula programs, and discretionary programs. Um, you can wait till the end to ask questions. You can raise your hand while I'm doing this presentation. If you want to ask questions in the middle, I, it doesn't matter to me. <clears throat> okay, so highway formula programming. Massachusetts five year apportionments under bill, and that's 2022 to 2026, include approximately $5.4 billion in highway funds. It's important to remember that 3.5 billion of that is the reauthorization of amounts already programmed in the 22 to 26 step. Okay, so while bill is funding 5.4 million, 3.5 billion, I'm sorry, billion, 3.5 billion is already in the step. An additional 449 million is increased funding for existing STIP programs. So, you know, there's surface transportation block grant program, there's an HPP, all of those programs got additional money that needs to be programmed in the TIP. In addition, there's 1.4 billion for other formula programs. That 1.4 billion, and again, these are new programs. They don't exist today in, in the TIP. They don't exist in the STIP. They're not, they're not currently funded. Well, they're funded, they're not programmed. So 1.4 billion, that includes 1.125 billion for a new bridge formula program, 106.5 million for a new resiliency program. Its moniker is PROTECT. 93.7 million for a new carbon reduction program. 63.5 million for a new electric vehicle infrastructure program. And 9.1 million for ferry boats and terminals. <clears throat> so, Federal transportation funding in bill is divided into three types, contract authority, supplemental appropriations, and authorizations subject to appropriation. So contract authority is for trust fund projects. 
programs funded out of the highway trust fund. Um, it basically is, is self-effectuating. You do not require an appropriations bill to have contract authority. However, Congress annually places an obligation limitation that constrains the amount of apportionment you can actually spend in a given year. 83% of the transportation funding in bill is contract authority. Supplemental appropriations are appropriations made in the Reauthorization Act instead of in the appropriate annual appropriations bill. Again, they're self-effectuating. They don't require anything other than, than inclusion in the bill, but they are not subject to the annual obligation ceiling. They come with their own obligation limitation as it were. Approximately 13% of this funding in bill, in bill is supplemental appropriations. And then there are authorizations subject to appropriation. That's a promise to do something in the future. Um, that's where Congress says this program is authorized up to $50 billion, but no money is actually available until the Appropriations Act puts the money in, 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 in the program. And approximately 4% of bills funding is subject to future appropriation. So as Ken alluded to earlier, Congress has not yet passed the Transportation Appropriation Act. Instead, we are operating under a continuing resolution um, that I believe expires on March 11th because today at 10.30, supposedly the Senate was voting on the House bill and was going to approve the continuing resolution. So we do not have a bill. We will not have an appropriations bill at least through March, probably 11th. Um, we'll see what happens after that. So the CR is based on the FACT Act, FAST Act, not bill. It does not provide sufficient obligation authority for the FY22 increases contained in bill nor does it allow the implementation of any new programs under FHWA's contract authority. That would be new carbon reduction and protect. So right now, we're acting as if, under the continuing resolution, we're acting as if the FAST Act, for obligation purposes, as if the FAST Act is still in play and bill has not passed. Programs funded with supplemental appropriations, the new bridge formula program, the electric vehicle formula program, do not rely on contract authority. And so they're not subject to obligation limitation and they can be implemented regardless of the continuing resolution. So that money is available. So how does all this become a TIP target? Regional target funding in the TIPs is based on formula funds annually apportioned to the state from the Highway Trust Fund. Consistent with a long established process, Massachusetts distributes approximately a third of these funds among the state's MPOs based on a formula developed by the Massachusetts Association of Regional Planning Agencies. Based on an assumed obligation authority of 90%, because again, remember, we get an apportionment, and then Congress gives us an obligation ceiling, and then that constrains how much of the apportionment you can spend. And over a five-year rolling average, we've had a, an average of, uh, obligation ceiling of 90%. So based upon that, for the four years of the upcoming TIP that are covered by bill, FY 23 to 26, the statewide increase in STIP funding is approximately $442.2 million. And again, this is exclusive of the highway, the non-highway trust fund programs. This is just highway trust fund programs. The increase in the overall regional target funding will be $150.7 million. And the increase in the Boston MPO target funding is $64.7. The fifth year of the TIP, as Matt Genova talked about, FY27 is not actually covered by bill but it will be based on an assumed amount consistent with Bill's annual amounts. Now, these numbers on this screen are federal aid only. And so if you gross them up with the match, they will reflect the numbers Matt showed you earlier. <clears throat> Programming bill and statewide funding. So statewide funding in the TIP is based on a combination of the formula funds annually apportioned to the state from the Highway Trust Fund and formula funds apportioned to Massachusetts from Bill's supplemental appropriations. Again, consistent with the long established process, approximately two thirds of the highway trust funds are distributed to statewide projects and programs. This includes highway bridge, bicycle pedestrian projects, as well as grant anticipation of repayments, MPO planning funds, extra work orders and award adjustments, et cetera. Those all come out of the statewide portion of the STIP. Bill supplemental appropriation formula funds include formula bridge program and the electric vehicle program and the ferry boat terminal program. They're all available. They're programmed through the, will be programmed through the mass dot portion of the STIP. So just a quick note on supplemental appropriations. Programs funded with supplemental appropriations are not subject to obligation limitation. So everybody who's, who's 
been here for a long time, knows our stip rule of use it or lose it. You get it in FY22. If you can't spend it in FY22, we have to take it from your project and give it to another because if we don't spend it, we lose it. That is not true for supplemental appropriations bills, I mean, programs. Each of those programs is governed by specific statutory language. So Massachusetts apportionments under the Formula Bridge program is estimated to be $1.1 billion over five years, or approximately $225 million a year. Annual funding under this program is available for obligation for a period of four years. So what that means is FY22 funds can be obligated between FY22 and 25, similarly 23 between 23 and 26 and so on. So unlike normal highway trust fund funded obligation authority control pro programs, this program doesn't have to be spent in the year it was given to us. Massachusetts apportionment under the new electric vehicle infrastructure program is estimated to be 63.5 million over five years. Funding under, under this program is available until expended. However, before you can spend any of this money, you have to have a state electric vehicle infrastructure plan approved by Federal Highway. So here's the takeaways. That was a lot of information. Over the five-year period, FY22 to FY26, Bill increased Massachusetts transportation formula funding by over 34%, including 449 million in increased apportionments for existing programs, 200 million for two new H highway trust fund funded programs, that would be carbon reduction and protect, and 1.2 billion for two new supplemental appropriation funded programs, the Formula Bridge Program and the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. The failure to pass an Appropriations Act, coupled with the language of the existing continuing resolution, prohibits Bill's 2022 increase from taking effect and constrains the implementation of the Carbon Reduction and Protect programs. Should Congress address this issue by passing uh, either an appropriations bill or a continuing resolution that takes into account bill, the current TIPS will need to be amended to program the 2022 increase. Bill's supplemental appropriation formula funds have been apportioned to the state. Bridge funds are available for programming now in, in 22, and electric vehicle infrastructure funds cannot be programmed until completion of the FHWA approved state EV plan. Now we're going to transition to transit. Transit formula fund. Massachusetts five-year transit fund formula funding under the bipartisan infrastructure law is approximately $2.8 billion, of which $2.2 billion is for the MBTA. The FY22 to 26 STIP programs approximately $1.6 billion in MBTA formula funds, leaving an increase of 581 million to be programmed now. The MBTA's transit formula funds under bill are composed of $968 million in urbanized area funds, formula funds, which is an increase of 193 million, 1 1.2 billion in state of good repair funds, which is an increase of 389 million, and 31 million in bus and bus facility funds, which is actually a slight reduction of funding. Bill did not establish any new transit formula funds. Now we're going to transition out of formula funding to talk about discretionary programs because there's a lot of information about discretionary programs that needs to be provided. So Bill includes authorizations for over 35 discretionary programs administered by USDOT Office of the Secretary and the operating agencies with a total funding in excess of $110 billion. So these are competitive. Um, various programs have various rules about who can compete and, and what the requirements are but there's $110 billion of discretionary money that will be awarded over the next five years. This includes 18 existing programs that are reauthorized for an aggregate amount of approximately 77.3 billion and 19 new programs that are authorized for an aggregate amount of approximately 36.1 billion. These grants are administered by the following entities within USDOT. Office of the Secretary, there are five programs authorized at 19 billion. FHWA, there are 17 programs authorized at 28.4 billion. FTA, there are 10 programs authorized at 19.4 billion. FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, there are four programs authorized at 44.3 billion. And Maritime has one port program authorized at 2.3 billion. I should note there are other programs. These are just the operating agency and office of the secretary programs. So this doesn't include things like motor carrier safety or NHTSA or those types of programs. Transit projects may be eligible for funding under FHWA or FARA programs, depending upon statutory language and the particular project. So 
the fact that FTA has 10 programs at 19.4 billion doesn't mean that that's the only amount of money that MBTA will compete for. The MBTA may compete under other programs. So programs controlled by the Office of the Secretary, I'm going to just go over three um, rather large ones. The first is the local regional project assistance grants, so-called RAISE program. It's been in existence for a while. Um, I think it was originally Tiger, then it was Build, then it was RAISE. It's currently still called RAISE. Um, it's an existing program, reauthorized at $7.5 billion over five years. A notice of funding opportunity for FY22 was issued February 4th, and applications are due on April 14th. The total amount of funding available in FY22 is $1.5 billion, which is a 50% increase over FY21. So this is the first program where there are actual projects being solicited under a discretionary program for Bill. Okay. Um, last year, MassDOT competed and asked for submitted three projects. Um, we did not win any, although the city of Boston submitted a project and won, a, I think it was a $10 million grant for um, Columbus Avenue, I think it was. National Infrastructure Project Assistance Grants, so-called mega projects. This is a new program. It's authorized at $5 billion over five years. <coughs> USD expects to release project selection criteria in February, and then they will go to a NOFA process. Um, right now, we don't know have, have a lot of information on, on it other than what's in the bill. Safe Streets and Roads for All. This is a new program. It's authorized at $5 billion over five years. Um, USDOT expects to issue the NOFO in the second quarter of the calendar year. Um, this program, interestingly enough, is not open to states. It's open to MPOs and local governments and federally recognized tribes and combinations thereof. So um, cities and towns in Massachusetts should be looking at this program to see if, if they want to apply and MassDOT will um, assist where we can because we're not allowed to actually apply for ourselves. Discretionary programs controlled by FHWA. I'm only going to go over six of them here today. The first one is nationally significant freight and highway projects, the infra program. It's an existing program. It's reauthorized at $8 billion over five years. That includes a $750 million set aside for state incentive pilot programs. Bill also includes an additional $6 billion authorized for this program subject to appropriation. So that's, again, not real money. It's a cardboard check. You can't cash it, but it could become real money. FHWA expects to release a notice of funding opportunity in the first quarter of calendar year 22. The Bridge Investment Program. This is a new program authorized at $12.5 billion over five years. It includes a $200 million set aside for tribal bridges and $100 million set aside for planning. Bill also includes, again, $4 billion more authorized subject to appropriation. This program is funded with both supplemental appropriations, $9.2 billion, and contract authority, $3.3 billion. Again, contract authority cannot be assessed under existing continuing resolution. So FHWA has not yet announced the next milestone for this program. I'm not sure whether they're going to release the supplemental appropriation or whether they're going to, they're waiting because of, you know, kids being the eternal optimist, optimist beliefs they're gonna pass an appropriations act. Maybe they're waiting for um, full funding. Promoting, this is what PROTECT stands for, ready? Promoting resilient operations for transformative, efficient and cost-saving transportation. That's the PROTECT program. It's a resiliency program. It, it is both a formula program and a discretionary program. We talked about the formula portion of it earlier. The, the discretionary program is authorized at $1.4 billion over five years. And again, that's a supplement to the $7.3 billion formula program. It includes $325 million set asides for at-risk at coastal infrastructure, community resilience and evacuation routes, and planning. Funded with contract authority, which cannot be accessed on access, access, accessed during the current, the existing continuing resolution. So there is no no foe on this. Um, the money's not really available yet. Hopefully something will happen that will make it available in 2022. Charging and fueling infrastructure grants. This is a new program authorized at 2.5 billion over five years. Again, it supplements the $5 billion formula program. It's divided equally between the quarter, pro, a quarter program, which is funding infrastructure, electric vehicle infrastructure on designated corridors, primarily based on FHWA guidance, the interstates, and a community program, which will be a $1.25 or $2.5 billion, I'm sorry, yeah, a $1.25 billion program 
to make grants to communities to put electric vehicle charging infrastructure in communities. It's funded with contract authority. So again, can't be accessed yet. And hopefully something will happen. And they'll be able to release FY22 money in 22. Rural surface transportation grants will not have much of an impact in Boston, but it is a new program authorized at $2 billion over five years. It includes three set asides, 10% for small projects under 25 million, 25% for the Appalachian Development Highway, which of course is not in, in Massachusetts, and 15% for states with higher than average rural roadway lane departure fatalities. Again, it's funded with contract authority. Can't be funded until either an appropriations bill or a new continuing resolution that authorizes bill. Final one is reconnecting communities pilot program. This is a new program authorized at a billion dollars over five years. It's funded with both supplemental appropriation and contract authority, $500 million each. Since contract authority cannot be accessed yet, it's not clear whether FHWA will release the money until the um, contract authority is available. And as such, they have not yet designated a milestone for this program, the next milestone. So FTA, there are five large programs missed by FTA, capital investment grants, low no emission buses, bus and bus facility, stations accessibility program, oh, the all stations accessibility program, and the rail vehicle replacement grants. So capital investment grants, it's an existing program. It's authorized at $8 billion over five years includes an additional 15 billion authorized subject to appropriation. It funds new starts, small starts, and core capacity projects, each with their own statutory requirements and each with a multi-step, multi-year development process. So this is not like most of the competitive grants where an application is, is released and you apply because you have a project. This is a, a long development process. So those of you who know the green line know how long it took us to get from beginning to award. Uh, low no emission bus grants, again, and it's an existing program authorized at 5.6 billion over five years. The FY22 amount is estimated to be 1.1 billion and FTA expects to issue the NOFO in the first quarter of calendar year 22. Bus and bus facility competitive grants. It's an existing program authorized at $2 billion over five years, it supplements a $3.2 billion formula program. The FY22 amount is estimated at $376 million, and FTA expects to issue a NOFO in the first quarter of 22. The All Stations Accessibility Program is a new program authorized at $1.8 billion over five years. Its purpose is to upgrade the accessibility of legacy rail fixed guideway public transportation systems for people with disabilities. The program requirements are still being developed, and FTA, FTA I'm sorry, has not yet announced a milestone for this program. The Rail Vehicle Replacement Grants, it's a new program authorized at 1.5 billion over five years. It's limited to a maximum of three projects per year and projects may be multi-year. The FFY 2022 amount is estimated to be $300 million and FTA expects to issue the NOFO in the second quarter of calendar year 22. And that's it, I'll take questions. Jay Monty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there are a few uh, statistics in here that said, you know, three projects per year or some percentage of the program is intended for um, a certain certain uh, type of project. Um, are those on a state by state basis? So is it three projects per year by state or is it three projects per year, you know, nationally? Yeah, so, so the real vehicle grants are three projects per year nationally. Uh, thank you. Other questions? Tom O'Rourke. Thank you, and, and thank you for that presentation. Um, you know, it, it, it's great to see all this additional funding coming in um, and the ability to do these projects is, is exciting. My concern is, um, as was referenced earlier, the, the uh, difficulty in getting materials and there's a worker shortage. Um, do you have concerns about the ability of states to actually have the capacity to manage all this? Right, so um, we are staffing up at the highway division. Um, we are staffing up at MassDOT to, to, to take this on. We, we, we're developing plans. We're, we're actually hiring people now as we speak. Um, there is some concern about this a lot of work over a very compressed period of time. It's also, there's also some concern about the ability of the industry, although the industry 
again, has said that, that they will they will staff up and manage it. Um, and then there's also, as Tom Bent mentioned earlier, the supply chain concern, right? Um, that's particularly true in some instances because of the new Buy America requirements. So there, there are that you know there are only so many players in the EV market, as an example. Many of them aren't used to, to the Buy America provisions. It may take a while for us all to get, get on the same page, but but we think as of today that, that we will be able to deliver and manage this program. And and you know, uh, we sort of everybody sort of has no choice, right? I mean, the money's coming and we need we need to we need to figure out how to do it, and we think we're going to. Uh, thank you. Yep. Kim Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And very good job. That, that was excellent. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, uh, just a, a comment about uh, the, you mentioned something about uh, the state helping. You know, a lot of these programs, uh, as you mentioned, uh, pointed at a couple of them, are, are open to uh, uh, local uh, governments to apply directly and also to become direct recipients of the funding. Where, whereby the funding does not necessarily go through the state DOT. Now, sometimes uh, these, uh, if, if, a, if, a, if a municipality, for example, or an MPO uh, was a recipient, you know, applied and, and got one of these, they, they, could, they could ask the state for help. They could ask that the funds go through the state. Frankly, uh, for, uh, uh, David, you just talked about uh, staffing concerns. Well, there's only 20 of us here in the Massachusetts division. If we had hundreds of you know, uh, dozens and dozens of direct recipients. Uh, you know, we're we're going through the same kind of exercise that you are in terms of trying to figure out how to how to do this. Um, so, um, uh, just point out that anybody who is a direct recipient uh, does have to conform to, as like David mentioned, by America, but does have to conform to all federal uh, contracting and. Uh, uh, regulations and things like that. So this is something to keep in mind, but we, we do encourage people to apply. We hope uh, that the state has the capacity at some point and willingness to uh, to help uh, uh, municipalities and other recipients uh, 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 move these projects along. But you know, again, you know, who knows? It, there's a there's a lot of there's a lot up in the air. Thank yes. You. So so I should thanks, Ken. I should note that yes. All of these, almost all of these, if not all of these programs are, are available for local governments to apply. Okay. So MassDOT is, we're at our presentation to the Massachusetts Association of Regional Planning Agencies. We were asked to start a process with them to think about how MassDOT can be helpful to local governments, both in trying to figure out which, which programs fit for which, which projects and also whether there's some way that MassDOT can help prioritize some projects. Now, regardless of whether MassDOT thinks it's a priority or not, local governments are by definition eligible to apply and can apply without MassDOT itself. But yes, we, we are trying to work with MARPA and figure out is there a way that we can be helpful? We're also mindful that we have 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts and the vast majority of them probably do not have the wherewithal to, to draft an application that will be successful. And so we are trying to be, figure out how we can partner with them to, to, to be as helpful as we can so that everybody has a chance to, to get some, some benefit out of the bill beyond just the formula programs. Jim Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, extremely helpful uh, breakdown. And digestion of, of, of all the things coming at us from the bill grant. So um, I'm assuming this is something you could share with us um, in lieu of, of, you know, getting 101 requests from every municipality to come yeah, yeah, to the presentation. Yeah, people put that in the chat. I, yeah, it's, it's totally oh, my responsibility. It's not, it's not in your um, packet today, but yes, I've, I've sent it to the staff. We will post it on the website. It'll be available to everybody. Excellent. Really helpful. Thank you. I'm looking forward to Exploring opportunities. Thanks, Jim. Other questions? Daniel Amstutz. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for providing this uh, presentation and going through it. 
step by step, you know, the federal budgeting and contract authority and all the terminology is very, even, even if you've been around it for a little while, it's still very hard to understand sometimes. Um, and yes, I was going to ask about posting it to the website too. So thank you for that. So I think my last question was just about what you said a moment ago regarding like the cities and towns being able to apply for some of these programs directly or funding directly. And I wonder if that could be included or, or, or um, also uh, outlined somewhere. Um, Cause I think the only one that I, I think was called out specifically was that um, like safe streets uh, program. I don't remember yeah. about the other ones. Yeah, so Safe Streets for All was called out because it is the, it is the only program that the state is not eligible to apply for. Okay. But but I think I, I will certainly try to find out find something to, to to do that for everybody. But I do think that for most of these programs, with with the exception of the FTA funded ones, which are generally provided to, to transit agencies, most of these programs are eligible for cities and towns to apply for. You should you should assume they are if unless I tell you they're not but I, but I will try to figure out a way to, to put something together with the staff that lets people know. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bill Conway. Uh, thank you for Mr. Chair. Thank you for this. This is very informative. Um, I just I had a question on one of the slides as it relates to uh, waterway work. Uh, and see if it had to do with some overlap with FEMA funds. Um, is is there an overlap there? Or are there just, I mean, obviously two different agencies, but is there possible to get those grants as well? Right, so, that, so uh, because of my area of knowledge, um, <laughs> this is limited to transportation, but yes, yeah. Bill includes um, funding for broadband, Bill includes funding for environmental remediation and, and other issues. There is a, there is a, over a, what I think Massachusetts expects to receive maybe a billion three, maybe is the number I have in my head. Uh, right. Uh, yep. um, you should contact EEA to talk about that because they are the, you know, they, they have the expertise to know like how, how to, how to get the bill money that is environmental. Um, the only two programs that, that we and EEA share are um, carbon reduction and protect and electric vehicle. We, we will work with them on those programs. They are mass uh, they are US DOT controlled programs. So MassDOT will be the lead agency, but we will work with them on those. But other programs, you, sh you should talk directly to EEA on those. Okay, all right. Thank you, Dan. Yep. Other questions? Hi, um, David, thank you. Um, appreciate you laying this all out, super helpful. But um, I guess what I'm trying to understand better, so I'm new to the MPO, relatively speaking, and yeah. you know, my background's planning and economic development, less so transportation, but that nexus obviously, you know, is critical to making anything happen. So, um, you know, you know, if you were me kind of in this position, kind of looking at this, I'm curious how um, I should be kind of understanding kind of the MPO's role with the municipality, with MassDOT, um, kind of I need a roadmap trying to, to guide me to understand how to best leverage this. And, you know, I'm happy to work with our regional partners and, you know, I think it's exciting. Um, but I don't know, you know, you know, where I should kind of start to coalesce some of this, whether it's energy around, you know, the people or looking at projects. So I don't know if you have any insight from that perspective. Yeah. So, so I would, I would say there's, there's two different things. There's, there's, Melissa, the MPO member, and Melissa, the city, the town of Burlington employee. Okay, as an MPO member, it's it's really all about the formula, the formula programs, and and as Matt went over earlier, there's a lot of new money that we weren't expecting that we're going to divide. You know, we're going to program to projects. You should be thinking about both the town of Burlington as well as your subregion, as well as the region, about whether there are projects that can get ready in the next five years. Right. Because part of my concern is 
I think sometimes people self-edit, right? I think there may be more projects that could possibly be in the mix for TIP funding than we know about because people didn't submit them because they didn't think they were ready or they didn't think they score well and they didn't think there was a, there was a lot of money. There's a lot more money. So, so I, I think before we decide that we're done and we have all the projects in the universe, you, you as an NPO member, you, you as, as, as a sub-regional member, should, should probably contact your sub-region and say, hey, this is, this, is, this is what we know about additional money Based on what Matt said earlier, I'm reading the tea leaves and I believe that there are most, there, there's not enough projects at 25% that are going to take all of that money, right? So, so I think you should, you should be doing that outreach to, to your sub-regional entities. Always working through the, 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 the you know, the MAPC sub-regional coordinator probably, okay? Then as, as, a, as a local government representative, there are, Lot, there's lots of money going to, going to be flowing really quickly, particularly if they pass an appropriations bill, right? They released the raise grants, and now we have to have all our, our applications in in April. That's going to be, um, you know, you should be thinking about whether you have unmet transportation needs that could become a project that could qualify for an application. And then if you do, at some point, MassDOT, once we figure, figure out how we're gonna do this, is, is, is happy to have a discussion with you about whether, what, pro, what projects it might be a good fit for, whether, whether there's any interest in MassDOT co-applying. Um, we, we wanna be as helpful as we can. It is still, unfortunately, it, it seems to me st to be still early days and yet it's not. So, but if, if like, if you like, because you do e economic development, if there's like say a downtown project that, that, that Burlington thinks if we just had money to do this, we could leverage all of this, we'd be happy to have that discussion and figure out if, if we think there's a place for a, an application. And until, until, until we, we figure out something else, people can just contact me and I'll, 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 I'll be the MPO members. Um, sort of guide, guide until, until we figure something else out at Mass Time. David Kozis. Thank you. So of course the, um, the all stations accessibility program caught my eye. You know, a lot of funding um, specifically would be available for legacy systems and, you know, for ADA improvements, it would certainly relate to probably a lot of different MBTA stations. So I guess that we're waiting now just for additional requirements, you know, to be relayed to us. And um, so is that what's happening is that MassDOT's just, we would just all be waiting for these additional requirements to come forward before MassDOT could sort of decide what, you know, what, we, what might be the highest priorities and um, in terms of deciding what we would want to apply for. Is that the right way to think about it? Yeah, so there, sort of, okay. So there, there, there's two things. One is we're waiting, particularly for the new programs. We are waiting for additional guidance from the federal government, right? Because, you know, bill's 2,000 pages. It's got a lot of, you know, it's written, it's written as, a, as laws often are to be very confusing. Not digitally, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> So, so we are waiting for some better guidance from the federal government on some of these new programs. That being said, we are, you know, we are internally developing some lists of, of what do we think might be good candidates? What, what, are, what are projects we just don't have the formula funding for, but would like to do if we could capture additional money? So, so MassDOT, the MBTA, we're, we're internally thinking about this. And I would encourage, like I did Melissa, cities and towns to think about that. Are there projects that you think and for, again, for my purposes, transportation projects, but it's also true for environmental projects and broadband access. And I think there's even cybersecurity. So you should be thinking about that too. And again, at some point, MassDOT's gonna to try to figure out if there's a way that we can do something with the RPAs and the MPOs to, to, to have a bigger discussion about like, we shouldn't all necessarily apply for raise in the same year. That being said, 
it's not our call to make. If you as a, if you as a city or town think you, you want to apply for a program, whether we think it's quote unquote a priority or not, you should you should apply if you want to, right? But there's a lot of programs and there's and 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 it's going to be it's not easy to apply, okay? The application is generally the ones that win are usually done by consultants and, and aren't just you know an individual person in the city or town fills out a form and submits it. So so you know. I wish I had more detailed information to give you yet, but but we are we are we are trying to figure out a way to be as helpful as we can, both in 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 managing the process as well as helping with specific projects, while not saying to anybody it's our decision to make because it's not. Other questions? All right, seeing that I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And as I said, I have emailed this to Jonathan and Matt and they will make it available. And now the next item on our agenda is member items. Are there any member items at this time? Lynn Dickens. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I failed to say it during my own uh, report. I, mean, uh, uh, I just want to express my appreciation to Ms. Foley I and mean, uh, to say that I will miss her. I mean, I mean uh, so she did a lot of um, groundwork for me for the MPO and it's very much appreciated. So uh, all you people leaving, you're breaking my heart. I mean, so thank you so, and wish you the best. You know? Well spoken, Lynn. I'm sure everybody on the MPO shares, shares your sadness at seeing Regine go. She's been, been an asset from day one. Other members, any items? Seeing none, can I get a motion and a second to adjourn and please state your name for the record? Tom Bent. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion to adjourn. Thank you, Lynn Diggins. Leonard Diggins, second. Thank you. Without objection, we are adjourned. We'll see everybody in a couple of weeks. Bye, guys.